This is CBC Here and Now. If we came close, it would be a victory. If we won, it would be a triumph. Chess Crosby comes out on top in the Windsor Lake by-election. The leader of the PC party will now have a seat in the House of Assembly. The St. John's Regional Fire Department hosted a little show and tell for politicians and decision makers to show them exactly what they do, and they invited me to tag along. Hence why I'm hanging out on the side of the building. That story, coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, it was an explosive report given at the Muskrat Falls inquiry today as the lawyers heard why Muskrat Falls may not have been the most cost effective option for the province from the get go. And that more could have been done to minimize the risk of cost overruns. Here and Now's Jacob Barker is live tonight in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Jacob, what did you hear during today's testimony? Well, Debbie, today the auditors from Grant Thornton were dealing with the sanctioning phase of Muskrat Falls, and they say that NALCOR's cost estimate for the project was underestimated. Uh, number one on the P50 side, we know that Manitoba Hydro, BC Hydro, and Hydro Quebec on uh, large construction projects uses P50. So right away, we'd just like to add that to the equation. It's not unusual, as do many oil companies. Uh, the second thing with respect to um, you know the uh, what they call the uh, strategic risk, uh, which is risks of things that the project team doesn't control. And we heard from the expert uh, earlier this week that uh, oftentimes uh, projects do not include that in the budget that goes to the project team. So we, we did not either. And the other point that was made here today, uh, I agree with, is that the key is you need to uh, fund that contingency, that type of contingency. You need to fund it. You don't have to put it in the context, but you need to fund it. And we did fund it. We just want to point out we've had a little bit of a problem with the video for Jacob's reporting tonight. We'll get right back to that, but first we want to tell you about this political news. The leader of the progressive conservatives, Chess Crosby, will now have a seat in the House of Assembly. He'll be the next MHA for Windsor Lake. Yes, it was a tense evening, but when the votes were all counted, Crosby had 218 more votes than Liberal candidate Paul Antle. He entered his campaign headquarters to cheers of yes for chess. Stopping to kiss his father on the cheek and raising his hands in John Crosby's familiar victory salute. This was a hard hill to climb. This was a district three years ago where the liberal candidate took two thirds of the vote. It was always going to be tough. If we came close, it would be a victory. If we won, it would be a triumph. <laughs> and we won. Victory for Crosby marks a vote of confidence in his leadership. And when the election was called, Paul Antle visited PC headquarters to concede. He was joined by Premier Dwight Ball, who already has his eyes fixed on next year's provincial election. He ran a great campaign. Paul was a great candidate, uh, very professional, very respectful. And every day that uh, he participated in campaign, uh, I believe we had the best candidate that we could have. Uh, to go against Chess Crosby. But I'm looking forward to facing Chess now in the House of Assembly, but I can guarantee you we've got a great team. This is a, a district, that, of course, that has been the swing district for, for many, many years, but very proud of the efforts that Paul Lancel put into this campaign. And in about 30 minutes, we'll have my sit-down interview with Chess Crosby to talk about the significance of this win for him and the party. The man Chess Crosby replaced as Tory leader isn't ruling out a return to politics, possibly at the federal level. Former Premier Paul Davis made an appearance at Crosby's headquarters last night to show his support for the winner of the Windsor Lake by-election. When our Anthony Germain asked him about his intentions for next year's provincial and federal elections, Davis did not say his political life is over. 
former premier and a person who stood in. Everything's a possibility. <laughs> Anything's a possibility. Uh, you know, yeah, like, uh, yeah, there's a future ahead in politics. I don't, I don't know what my, well, for politics there is. I don't know what my role is going to uh, be in I was in wondering that. if Andrew Shear's been giving you a phone call, that's all. Uh, well, you know, I got to know Andrew Shear as uh, when I was leader and he became leader. Uh, I worked closely with Rana Ambrose before that. I think it's very, very important uh, for us to uh, try and tighten and, and improve on those uh, relationships. An East Asian tradition is coming to St. John's tonight. International students are gathering at Memorial University to celebrate the Moon Festival. Many different cultures coming together for this. We'll take it there live, coming up shortly on Here and Now. Look forward to that. And now let's go back to our top story on the Muskrat Falls Inquiry. Yes, as we mentioned, there was an explosive report given at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry today. The lawyers heard why Muskrat Falls may not have been the most cost effective option for the province right from the start. And that more could have been done to minimize the risk of cost overruns. And joining us once again, here now is Jacob Barker, who is in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So Jacob, uh, what did you hear during today's testimony? Well, the, uh, the auditors from Grand Thornton were dealing with the sanctioning phase of Muskrat Falls, and they said the cost estimate for the project uh, made by Nalcor was, under, was underestimated. There were stacks of documents laid out as exhibits today. The auditors had limited time to go through 2,500 documents and interview over 40 people for the report. This included Nalcor executives, including the person who had final say on the project, in this report referred to as the gatekeeper. Who is the gatekeeper? The gatekeeper would have been uh, the former CEO, Ed Martin. The report found that Nalcor overestimated costs for the isolated island option that would have used a combination of power generation option to meet the needs of the province. And on the other side, it underestimated the cost for what's called the interconnected island option, which included the construction of the Muskrat Falls project. The report found that Nalcor used a lower probability factor for risk when coming up with a price for the project. That's considered a very aggressive approach to take. If they had chosen a higher risk factor, it would have added about $800 million to the price tag. The audit also found that Nalcor inappropriately eliminated two options, one that it never engaged with Hydro-Quebec to import power from their grid, and two, it chose not to defer decisions to 2041 when power going to Quebec would be made available for Newfoundland and Labrador. It was eliminated based on the uncertainty pertaining to the availability of power. This assumption contradicted the NSUARB findings. Within 20 years of getting, obtaining 2041 power, and uh, certainly there could have been uh, tie-overs leading into that. I don't believe all the options were explored Skeptics of the project say this report is a vindication of what they've been saying for years. It was mani manipulative. I think uh, the proponents knew if the matter had to go entirely to the Public Utilities Board, we wouldn't be here today. The, the political factors here really were very important in driving uh, this decision. And uh, what we needed really was decisions that were based upon the needs for electric power as opposed to some kind of uh, smoke and mi mirrors or magic potion to e create economic development. Now, Jacob, uh, Nalcor's former CEO, Ed Martin, is at the inquiry listening to all of this. What's he saying? Yeah, well, he was here uh, taking it all in as he has been every day. And after the presentation, he defended the decision making around the sanctioning of the Muskrat Falls project. Uh, number one on the P50 side, we know that Manitoba Hydro, BC Hydro, and Hydro Quebec on uh, large construction projects uses P50. So right away, we just like to add that to the equation. It's not unusual, as do many oil companies. Uh, the second thing with respect to um, you know the uh, what they call the uh, strategic risk, uh, which is the risks of things that the project team doesn't control. And we heard from the expert uh, earlier this week that uh, oftentimes uh, projects do not include that in the budget that goes to the project team. So we, we did not either. And the other point that was made here today, uh, I agree with, is that the key is you need to uh, fund that contingency, that type of contingency. You need to fund it. You don't have to put it in the context, but you need to fund it. And we did fund it. 
Well, the presentation on the audit is far from over. Uh, the auditors are scheduled to testify three more days next week. And later in the inquiry, Ed Martin will have a chance to give his side of things. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Pretty nice and happy Valley Goose Bay tonight, but all of that is going to change. Tomorrow is the first day of fall and we're going to ring it in with our first storm of the season. Labrador will be hit hardest with wind and rain starting tonight. The Avalon should be the least effective, but everybody will get a taste of this. I'll break it all down in just a few minutes. The gathering place in St. John's was evacuated this morning after a small fire on the roof. Firefighters were at the Community Services Center shortly after 10 o'clock. People were rushed outside after smoke started pouring out of the second and third floor windows. Repair work was being done on the roof at the time. No one was injured, but the daily lunch had to be canceled as well as medical services. Well, I mean, that's what's really difficult. I mean, we're grateful, we're absolutely grateful that it, it was not worse than, than it is. But, you know, we had a medical clinic today. We had, you know, our own in-house case management, food, all the other services. So that's not available. And if it's not available for this population at the gathering place, sadly, they can't access the service anywhere else today. And that's what is really um, most disconcerting for us. Well, traffic was diverted and the power was out in downtown St. John's this afternoon after an accident. A truck crashed into a utility pole on the corner of Cochrane Street and Water Street, knocking out power. The RNC said that the street was closed in the area and people downtown should expect long delays. Police have made an arrest in connection with a probable bear spray attack at a high school in St. John's. Oh, what the? This cell phone video shows just what happened outside Prince of Wales Collegiate Wednesday morning. One teen sprayed another with what is believed to be bear spray, but at least 20 others were exposed to it during the incident. Many of them were taken to the Janeway for treatment. A 16-year-old boy was arrested yesterday afternoon on charges of assault with a weapon and breaching court orders. He was held in custody overnight at the Youth Remand Center. It's essentially a fight or a schoolyard fight. Uh, we've referred to it as an altercation in, in the uh, on school property there. Uh, there were several individuals who were kind of directly involved with it, and it appears a lot of onlookers. Uh, it was probably around a recess break, so there were a few extra people who were in the area, which is would account for why there was such a large number of people who uh, were exposed to the bear spray. Two feuding waste management boards in Newfoundland have finally come to an agreement to ship garbage. After months of disagreeing on garbage shipping fees, Western and Central have settled their differences. Here in House Colleen Connors explains why this is a big deal. Even though the West Coast has launched a brand new garbage program, your waste is still going to the dump. Western and Central waste management boards couldn't agree on a shipping fee to get the garbage from here to the state-of-the-art sorting facility in Norris Arm, until now. To say happy would be an understatement. This allows us now to complete the last piece of the program for Western Newfoundland. We now have a fully functional, operational waste management system in the way that we had intended it to be. The goal of this new waste management system is to stop burying garbage in the ground and collect it and move it to a central site. Both sides have finally agreed on a fee to ship that waste. Uh, but the waste itself, it begins going to Norris Iron Facility for processing on Tuesday. Because of the garbage fee feud, Environment Minister Andrew Parsons hired an independent consulting firm to look at the numbers at both boards. The firm will determine a reasonable permanent fee, and that information will be available in the next 30 days. And it allows both parties to say, folks, we've got along, We've arrived at this particular solution. Now let's focus our attention through the ministry and the department on getting a permanent solution in place. That's what this does for us. For now, all the blue bag recyclables picked up curbside will be sorted manually in Cornerbrook. Garbage will make its way through this transition site before moving to the more environmentally friendly site. Soon, the dump will be shut down for good. Because of this tentative agreement, the garbage will finally be leaving the dump outside of Cornerbrook. 
All the garbage bags will be put aboard one of these big silver trucks and transported across the highway to central Newfoundland, where it will end up in Norris Arm. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Wild Cove. Well, it's not easy fighting fires, and that's something St. John's Mayor Danny Breen and Premier Dwight Ball found out earlier today when they were given a crash course in Firefighting 101. Here now's Jeremy Eaton was on the scene. <laughs> We are hosting an event called the uh, Fire Ops 101. Um, it was developed by the International Association of Firefighters. Um, the purpose of the international purpose of the Fire Ops is to give politicians, decision makers, a better perspective on, on our job, our tasks, and uh, some of the different types of uh, rescue performance work that we were required to do. Four different scenarios going. We have a uh, vehicle extrication scenario, uh, whereby they understand. Uh, uh, vehicle techniques, extrication techniques. We have a search and rescue uh, scenario whereby they do a hose advance to a second floor and they're searching for two victims. Um, our third scenario is a confined space uh, search and rescue. Um, and our fourth is a medical scenario call where we're simulating a drug overdose. All right, now breathe in and just do again. That's better, that's better. Yeah. better. To see how difficult uh, it is to maneuver with all this equipment, deal with oxygen, uh, you know, stress. I mean, the stress levels when you're in there is just they're, they're starting to go up like this and how you can manage that, how you can hear. I, I couldn't hear a thing in there. And, he, you know, the, the captain was, you know, shouting as loud as he possibly could. You can't see when you're in there. I have a completely new perspective on what it, what it means to actually be a firefighter. So anytime you're inactive for 15 seconds or so, it'll start to alarm. Okay. So if you want to just shake it a little bit, it'll okay. just... You know, I thought I had a good understanding of how the fire department worked and what firefighters and first responders do, but I can tell you this was an eye-opener for me this morning. And it's also important for us, we make significant investments in the fire department because we understand that they need the tools to, that they need to protect us. And uh, those investments are important. Just, uh, you know, we just recently purchased new breathing apparatuses for the fire department. And this morning to see how important they are to the work that they do uh, is, is really something that's important for us to understand. Between the association and uh, the City of St. John's, we've really gotten proactive uh, with different programs to look out for our members, uh, to be able to recognize the signs of PTSD. Uh, we actually have a peer support team where firefighters talk to firefighters. We have a road to mental readiness course that everyone in the department's after uh, taking, which uh, teaches them about the signs of PTSD to recognize it. And we also have a critical incident stress management team as well that can come in after a, a major incident or a traumatic incident to help our members cope with this. Go ahead, too. We're seeing the importance of you know, PTSD. This is really impactful. And we've heard stories shared today of people, uh, you know, in w recent responses, how this actually goes back to some other point in time. And, and I know from my own experiences, you know, working in the health profession and as a volunteer, in, as a first responder in communities growing up, I know how impactful that is. There are situations that I know that personally that I've been into that I think about on a daily basis. So I can't imagine doing this for a living every single day and r not realizing, you know, what the next, what's around the next turn. Uh, what the next call would look like when you enter a scene. Well, it's a nice evening in St. John's following a very nice day. Oh, it was lovely out today, but the big question on a lot of minds tonight, what's the weather going to be like for the weekend? You'll get the answer coming up soon.
Welcome back to Here and Now. An East Asian tradition more than 3,000 years old is being celebrated at Memorial University in St. John's tonight. Yes, the Moon Festival is an important part of many Asian cultures, particularly in China. And for many international students, tonight's gathering will give them a taste of home. Here now, Zach Gowdy is there and joins us live. So Zach, what is the Moon Festival all about? Well, if you were in China or Hong Kong, Japan, Malaysia, many other Asian countries, everybody there would be getting ready for Moon Festival right now. And this is the first time the event has been brought here to Memorial University. It's all about the fall harvest family and prayers for good fortune. And tonight, we're showcasing aspects of uh, many different Asian cultures who are represented here. Uh, Leila Siamajiri is the uh, with the Graduate Students Union. We're helping put off this night. Uh, Leila, tell us about some of the different uh, cultures that we'll be seeing here and what's happening tonight. Tonight is the Mid-Autumn Festival or Moon Festival, which is celebrated in East Asian countries. It's almost comparable to North American Thanksgiving. It's a very, very important event. And tonight uh, we had the pleasure to uh, celebrate the first Moon Festival at St. John's, Newfoundland, with our Asian students from Chinese Youth Association, Hong Kong students, Japanese Culture Club, Vietnamese students, and Malaysian students. That's fantastic. And we have some uh, members of the Japanese Culture Club who are with us now. Uh, Michaela Pai is the president of that group. And Michaela, tell us about the Yukata demonstration that you guys are performing. Um, today we're going to discuss what the kata means to Japanese people and when it was created and why it's still worn today. Uh, traditionally, yukata was worn in Japan as a bathrobe, but today it's used at events and festivals to celebrate the history and culture. This is wonderful. This is part of a series of multicultural nights here at Memorial. How does it feel to have a, an event you know, from your home culture uh, that you get to participate in so far away from home? Like we try to make our home culture and try to feed into Canadian culture as well. We try to like let everybody know what is our home culture is. Yeah, so that's pretty much what we're doing. Wonderful. Yeah. And the friends and relatives that are back home be getting ready for Moon Festival. You guys could do it here as well. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, listen to the night's event is free and open to the general public. Uh, Layla, if people want to come down and join you, where can they uh, arrive? Uh, the event is being held at Bruno Center at Memorial University, St. John's campus. The event is from 6 to 9 and we have different performers from all over the countries. Yeah, we passed the food on the way in here. I'm hoping we're going to go back down there before too sure. long. <laughs> sure. Guys, thank you so much for joining me and have a thank great thank time. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. And we'll check back in again from the Moon Festival later in the show. Reporting live for Here Now, I'm Zach Gowdy. Well, there is some pretty nasty weather on the way. But nothing <laughs> like it was eight years ago today. This is an anniversary most people who were here will never forget. Oh, absolutely. Eight years ago today that Hurricane Igor struck the province, causing widespread power outages and destruction, isolating hundreds of communities for days before help could arrive. Yep, that was an unforgettable storm for sure. Yeah, we did so much coverage of that. There was so much to cover, unfortunately, all those culverts and, you know, sides of uh, highways washed away. It was remarkable. Hopefully, once in a lifetime for us anyway. <laughs> yes, well, there is definitely a storm coming through uh, tonight, but it's uh, it won't be quite like Igor, that's for sure. But before we get to that, I just wanted to show you this lovely photo. Uh, a few days ago, I showed you a photo of uh, some sunflowers with that dog, uh, Zoe. Yes. And uh, this one was sent in to me today, and I thought it was lovely. This is Andrew Young and his sunflower. He grew it from seed, and he is very proud of it. Well, you can tell he's proud, <laughs> and why wouldn't he be? Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. Unfortunately, a lot of plants will be taking a beating, though, uh, tonight. Uh, we'll start the weather forecast with a look at some of the warnings that are in place. We have a wind warning for uh, most of Labrador and the West Coast of the island gusts between 90 and 120 kilometers an hour and there's also a special weather statement in for the rest of the island because of this I am going to start with a close-up of Labrador to see how this is going to play out so here we are at 1 a.m. tonight uh, gonna start in Lab City pretty soon lots of rain pushing forward overnight tonight gonna hit the coast overnight 
You can see all that snow. Mostly Nain could be affected uh, by this snow, but we're looking at some pretty heavy rainfalls associated with this and some really high winds as well. For the island, uh, not going to be seeing that system until tomorrow morning. So overnight tonight, some cloud cover moving in for the west coast, but the west coast of the island really won't start to see it until uh, first thing tomorrow morning. So here are our overnight lows. We do have a frost advisory in place for the Avalon Peninsula as well. Uh, we're looking at about 10 degrees in Cornerbrook tonight. Five to 10 millimeters of rain could fall uh, just before morning. Uh, and as we head into Labrador, those amounts bump up for sure. 20 to 30 millimeters of rain expected in Lab West tonight, and those winds are really going to ramp up as well. Gusts up to about 70 this evening and along the coast overnight tonight about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain. Happy Valley Goose Bay could see about 15 to 25 millimeters of rain as well. So for the island tomorrow, this is how it's going to play out. Here we are at 8 a.m. and the rain has fully started on the west coast of the island and it's going to push eastwards all throughout the day. So the Buren Peninsula and Central around 2 o'clock tomorrow, it's going to get really hit with that rain and it won't be until really the evening hours that uh, St. John's will really start to feel that heavy, heavy rain. So uh, yeah, here we go again, pushing across uh, the whole island uh, tomorrow, looking at some uh, temperatures. This is going to bump up the temperatures, 16 degrees in St. John's expected tomorrow, only about five millimeters of rain expected with this, but winds gusting up to 80 kilometers an hour for central areas, 20 to 30 millimeters for the Harbor Breton area. So that place is going to be hit pretty hard by this five to 10 millimeters for the uh, northeast coast there, 15 to 25 for Corner Brook tomorrow and uh, 20 to 30 for Port of Basque uh, tomorrow. So lots and lots of rain associated with this tomorrow as well as for the Straits and for the rest of Labrador, things are going to start to clear off in the West tomorrow. But in behind that system, a chance of some flurries and Nain, as you can see, will really get the bulk of this 30 to 40 millimeters of rain and then the potential for some snow uh, in the evening hours. But Sunday is looking good. <laughs> I'll have those details coming up. Also coming up in the game of life, buying a brand new board game can be quite the risk. But if you're bored with the same old board games, the library's got a whole new collection up for grabs.
welcome back. If you love board games, but you're tired of playing Monopoly and Scrabble, now you can head down to the library and take your pick from new items on the shelves. Here now is Daniel McEachern has that story for us tonight. Newfoundland and Labrador Public Libraries have a new collection to offer, about 300 board games for people of all ages to sign out, from kids to adults. The collection does have classics like The Game of Life and Risk, but also includes newer favourites like Settlers of Catan. The games were donated by comic book store Time Masters, which bought them at an auction and then wanted to give them a good home. Rather than split them up, we decided to keep the collection together and we thought, who could use these more? Um, and the public library came into our, our mind. Library management jumped at the idea. They see it as a great way to get people in the door and to also help build important skills. One of our few collections that promote um, social interaction, language development skills, community building and collaboration, so all of the lifelong learning stuff that we really want to bring attention to in our communities. Also, we have early literacy practices for our children, and talking and playing are two of the five literacy practices that really encourage kids to explore and be creative. The A.C. Hunter Library in St. John's is housing about half the collection, with the rest of the games being sent to other libraries across the province. You can take them out for three weeks at a time, so sign them out, play them, return them, and then take out some more. Daniel McEachern, CBC News, St. John's. Well, as we reported earlier, it was a close race yesterday between the Conservatives and Liberals in the Windsor Lake by-election. But it was PC leader Chess Crosby who came out on top. Crosby defeated Liberal Paul Antle by just over 200 votes to take the seat. It is his first political victory. The NDP's Kerry Claire Neal was third. And the province's newest MHJ, Chess Crosby, joins me now. First of all, congratulations. Well, thank you, Debbie. Just to offer one correction, I did have to win the leadership in order to get this right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's two political victories, but I guess this one feels pretty sweet. Yeah, it was important, and I think I highlighted that when I made the comment about, well, I was being overly dramatic, but I wanted to draw attention to the fact that this was a critical by-election. And uh, having won it, I think we have momentum now, and it'll give the governing Liberal Party something to think about. You gave voters at the door something to think about when you were campaigning and you were saying to people, if you trust Dwight Ball, vote for him. If you don't, vote for me. Is that what happened? That's pretty well the pitch, but uh, you, you kind of shortened it <laughs> kind of cryptically. But yeah, that's the pitch, right? So uh, voters, it seems to me, accepted that pitch if you're happy with the last three years of Liberal government, by all means vote for the Liberal candidate. But if you're not, and you want someone in the House of Assembly to hold the government to account for what they're doing, then you know where to cast your ballot for Chess Crosby. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the way that cookie crumbled. And don't forget, that was a Liberal district with two-thirds of a Liberal, two-thirds of all the voters voted Liberal last time around. We've seen other party leaders, both federally and provincially, without seats. It is hard to be a leader without being in the legislature. Um, what difference does this win make for you and your party? I know you told me off camera, you went up to Confederation Building today and you actually belong there. But really, what difference does this win make overall for the party? Well, first of all, the authorities have to give me a parking spot at Confederation <laughs> Building. That'll be okay. Uh, <clears throat> but for, for our party, for the PC party, the task ahead is still to rebuild the party. Um, and that was always going to be the task. We're well on our way with that. That includes rebuilding district associations. It includes recruiting great candidates to offer to the voting public next year. It includes uh, building up a war chest so that we can fight on an equal footing against, uh, with the Liberals and the NDP, for that matter. So, uh, like I said before, momentum gives you, it gives you mo momentum in all those arenas where you have to be effective in order to be a force to reckon with and a contender for government and being in power. This by-election 
I guess you could look at it as really a, a dress rehearsal for the election campaign, and you've been quite clear what issues are important to you, lower taxes, mm. electricity rates, and so on. But you have been talking about wanting to change the mood out there amongst the electorate, changing it to optimism. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? Well, uh, I think right now, and the reason I got elected is there is a profound sense of malaise in the public and I you know I I've, I've had an intensive focus group session door to door <laughs> for the last 3 or 4 weeks and so I think I can speak with authority having listened to a lot of people on this there's a malaise and a sense that uh, a sense of drift in government that people's faith in government is being defeated they don't think the government is acting competently they don't see that they're getting real leadership. I mean, I had one gentleman on the door a couple of days ago tell me what we need is a dictator <laughs> to take control. <laughs> now, I'm, you know, I don't go with that prescription, <laughs> but that's symptomatic of the mood out there. And just to see you smiling like that, last <laughs> night you were pretty fired up and it was an emotional Chess Crosby. Is this something we're going to see more of? Well, you know, I think people are getting to know me better. I have different facets and different layers, and you're going to see most of them. Huh. Chess Crosby, thank you so much for uh, joining us, and uh, congratulations once again. Thank you very much, Debbie. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, time for this week's What Are You At feature. And this week, the CBC's Mark Cumby is making pizza in Trinity Bay with musician Jeff Young Husband. What are you at? We're in Whiteway, Trinity Bay, south. A little off-grid place. Then uh, over the past couple of years, I built this uh, wood-fired oven. My love of cooking with fire is, uh, goes probably back to, you know, I, I certainly was, I was a, you know, into the Boy Scout movement when I was a teenager. I was really into that, so I loved the camping aspect of it, and our troop did a lot of camping. Um, but then that led to my brother getting a place further up the bay, or down the bay, sorry, uh, in uh, New Melbourne. So we'd sort of go out and hike out to this spot carrying backpacks full of food and then do, like, gourmet dinners. 
out there on this point where no one can see us and the sun sets across Trinity Bay right in front of you. It was sort of a mystical, you know, experience. And so then my brother built a, a pizza uh, dome. I was at a couple of parties that he had with a bunch of friends out and like cranking that thing through the weekend. So there's this oven going outside and the sort of social and community center of the oven was uh, pretty cool. So I was like, you know, that sort of goes with my salvage building technique. I think it's doing what I what I hoped it would do, which is drawing some focus and giving people a place to hang around and you know enjoy food and socialize. We've had the fire burning now for about two hours or so, and so now we're going to push all the coals to one side and uh, and then sweep the floor so that we've got a clean spot to bake our pizza. We're going to bake it right on the bricks at the bottom. We call it a pizza oven, but man, we like you know last night. Last night we uh, roasted uh, a chicken and a whole bunch of vegetables in there, and then we were like toasting donuts in it later on. <laughs> uh, so um, I think we should uh, think about flipping this guy. Sorry, let's take a peek. Ooh. That looks pretty good to me. Nicely brown there. We'll spin it back just a little bit more browning. I think it's almost done. Make another one. So cool, I want one. <laughs> our What Do You At feature is produced in collaboration with our colleagues at CBC Radio's Weekend AM with Heather Barrett. And you can catch that show tomorrow from 6 to 9.30 AM, Newfoundland time, of course, on CBC Radio. Well, we're going back to the Moon Festival happening at Memorial University in St. John's. It's an ancient custom in several East Asian countries, and tonight many international students are bringing it to St. John's. Here now, Zach Gowdy is there joining us once again. Zach, what's happening now? Well, we're just enjoying some of the performances, demonstrations from the uh, Asian countries who are represented here tonight. And we're here with some of the performers. This is a band from Malaysia here with yeah. Simon Yap, Xi Jing Lin, uh, Alana Harriet, and Ivy Han, uh, all from Malaysia. And just tell me, Simon, uh, when you were growing up, how big a deal was the Moon Festival? Well, I mean, it is pretty big of a deal. I mean, we do, we do have a lot of like festivals. That we, a lot of families do celebrate it as well. Uh, a lot of fireworks going on as well. So it is pretty big. It is pretty big, yeah. yeah. How does it make you feel to be able to bring this part of home, you know, to a place like St. John's? It's really good. Um, I mean, it's a big part of my childhood. Like Simon says, you, you meet up with your family, you know, like you see long time family members who you haven't seen in a long time. And to be able to share that, you know, the unity of it, the, you know, symbolism of unity with the circular moon. You know, it's, uh, it's great. It's yeah. some good stuff. Some good stuff. <laughs> this is the first time Moon Festivals happened here uh, at Memorial. Does it also feel good to bring together the many different uh, Asian cultures and uh, the people who are here from those countries here at Memorial University? Yeah, definitely, because then we get to see like how other cultures actually celebrate it. Yeah. Because for us, we do it a little differently, and so does the people from other countries too. Yeah, but then like some things are also similar, so that's also really cool, because you see what you do that's the same, but also what you do that's really unique. So it's really cool to see how you guys are all kind of the same, but also kind of different in your own ways. Yeah. It's really interesting to see so many different takes on the same kind of a celebration. Yeah. Uh, just before I let you guys go, tell me about the performance you'll be doing later. Yeah, so we're going to sing uh, three songs. Uh, two Malaysian song and one which is, which is like an English which everybody would know how to sing it's um, Fly Me to the Moon so it's going to be like an interaction with everybody to sing and everything so I'm sure it'll be fun though I heard you warming up earlier it has a pop song it had beatboxing it had yeah. rap it was, it was really we have awesome. everything you know we got everything you know yeah 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 <laughs> well listen thanks so much for chatting with us tonight so really yeah. appreciate yeah. it they're performing around 8 o'clock if you want to take part in Moon Festival come on out to St. John's Memorial Campus at the Bruno Center the event is free reporting live I'm Zach Gowdy for here and now
Welcome back to Here and Now. As I mentioned earlier, Sunday is looking good, but for tonight, there's a storm a coming. We have all of these warnings in place. Wind warning for most of Labrador as well as the West Coast gusts up to 120 kilometers an hour possible there. So this is how it's going to play out this evening in Labrador. Snow in the north affecting Nain mostly and lots of heavy showers working their way from west to east overnight tonight. So the amounts that we're looking at about 5 to 10 millimeters for the coast of Labrador tonight 20 to 30 for Lab City and as well for the west coast of the island looking at about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain for tonight and that is going to ramp up on the island tomorrow. This is what we're going to see tomorrow morning. The rain is really going to kick into high gear for the west coast still going for the east eastern portion of Labrador and as well as for Nain, which will be the place that will get the bulk of this storm for central around two o'clock. Things are really going to be coming down pretty heavily and it won't be until later in the afternoon that uh, the Avalon Peninsula will really start to see uh, some heavier rain, but the winds are going to start pretty strong uh, earlier in the day, looking about at about five millimeters of rain for the east associated with the storm. Another five millimeters coming Saturday night, 10 to 15 for much of the south coast. 20 to 30 for Porta Basque and uh, 15 to 25 for Corner Brook tomorrow. So lots and lots of rain on the way for Labrador. Some of that will be mixed with snow, 30 to 40 millimeters for Nain. And in behind that could be a two centimeters of snow falling with this. And it's going to be very windy gusts along the coast, 60 up to 70 and uh, could be stronger as well. Behind the system, Lab City is looking at uh, some flurries moving through. So as we head into Sunday, though, uh, Things clear off quite nicely on the island and as well for Labrador. Later in the day, could see some showers though for the West Coast and Western Labrador, uh, looking at the chance of some afternoon flurries there. Temperatures staying pretty warm on the island though, 13 degrees in the east, 14 in central, and a chance of showers for Western Labrador on Sunday. And as we head into Monday, see all that snow for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So, chance of flurries for sure in that neck of the woods and some showers again for the west coast of the island. So for Monday, as you begin your work week, we're looking at temperatures between 8 and 10 degrees on the island. For Labrador, between 4 and 8 with those chance of flurries mixed in with some showers. And that's your forecast. This is our viewer photo of the day. Coming up after the break, I'll tell you where in the province this was taken. So interesting. I'm looking forward to finding out where that is, Carolyn.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's Friday, in case anyone needs a reminder. I certainly don't. But it's time now to uh, find out who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Congratulations to Bob and Doris Anthony of Lewisport on their 50th wedding anniversary coming up on the 25th. Happy 90th birthday to Mike Cumby, originally from Heart's Content, now in St. John's. His big day was Tuesday. Belated birthday greetings to James Squires of Burlington, who celebrated his 90th birthday, August 28th. Happy 67th anniversary to Ray and Joan House of London, Ontario. They're originally from St. John's. Happy 60th anniversary to Ernest and Elizabeth Wheeler from Mount Pearl, who celebrated on September 10th. They were married in Bishop's Falls in 1958. Happy anniversary to Frank and Lorna Chaffee, formerly of Corner Brook, now in Halifax. It's their 60th wedding anniversary on the 13th. Happy 50th anniversary next Tuesday to Fred and Teresa Collins of Winterland. Happy 50th anniversary as well to Norman and Gertie Henderson of Chamberlains. Another golden couple, George and Ida Butt of Lethbridge, celebrated their 50th on August 30th. Birthday greetings to Alan Freeman, formerly of Twillingate and Terranova, who will celebrate his 97th birthday tomorrow. He now lives in Gander. Happy 61st wedding anniversary to Mary and Andy Churchill of St. John's. That's coming up this Sunday. Happy 54th anniversary to Dominic and Madonna Fitzgerald from Southeast Placentia. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Mary and Bill Mercer of St. John's. Happy birthday to Aunt Rita Perry in Lewisport, who is celebrating her 93rd birthday today. Happy 65th anniversary to Raymond and Florence Rice of Seal Cove, White Bay. They celebrated on September 7th. Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Michael and Paula Reynolds of Riverhead Harbor Grace. Happy 65th wedding anniversary to Sydney and Alberta Morris of Robinsons Bay St. George South, who will celebrate their special day this Sunday. Happy 50th anniversary to Patrick and Maureen Fian of St. John's. Best wishes to Marjorie Party of Bonavista, who will be celebrating her 90th birthday this coming Tuesday. Happy 93rd birthday to Annie Studley from Point Leamington, who celebrated on the 14th. Happy 95th birthday to Anita Hillier at a Ruby Manor, whose special day was the 17th. A very special birthday. Best wishes going out to Gertrude Drover, who turned 100 years old yesterday. Happy 90th birthday to Reg King of Clarenville. Happy 65th anniversary tomorrow to Don and Louise Baird from Grand Falls, Windsor. It's a golden anniversary today for Lorraine and William Turner of Eastport. Another couple celebrating today. Congratulations to Maureen and Fonce Cheeseman from Torbay on their 50th anniversary. Happy 58th anniversary to Hector and Jean Earle living in St. Lunaire Gricket, who will celebrate on Sunday. Congratulations to Tom and Shirley Reed of Clarenville on their 66th wedding anniversary yesterday. It's a 56th wedding anniversary today for Cliff and Nina Wellen of Gander. Happy 90th birthday to Gertie Late from Davidsville, Gander Bay, coming up on the 26th. Happy 97th birthday to Teresa Keats, whose birthday was on the 18th. She's from St. Paul's River, Quebec, and is now in Blanc Sablon. Best wishes to Teresa O'Toole, who will be 90 years old tomorrow. Happy 90th birthday as well to Anthony O'Coin from South Branch, who celebrated yesterday. Happy anniversary to Richard and Patricia Quilty from Fox Harbor, who are celebrating 50 years of marriage today. Congratulations to Graham and Shirley Flight of Buckins, who celebrated 60 years of marriage yesterday. Happy 93rd birthday to Alice King of Grand Falls, Windsor, now in Botwood. Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Joey and Tilly Sullivan of Cape Royal. Happy 61st wedding anniversary to Bill and Winnie St. Croix of Goulds. Best wishes to Phyllis Hicks in Bonavista, who will celebrate her 93rd birthday on Sunday. And happy 90th birthday to Margaret Cooper of Old Shop, formerly of Harbor Buffett, who celebrated on the 18th.
Thank Congratulations you. once again to all hands. All right, let's see our viewer photo of the day. Any guesses where this might have been taken? I can't. Uh, that's not Harbor Grace, is it? No. It was uh, taken in one of the most picturesque. We get a lot of uh, photos from here. Beautiful Abana Vista. Uh -huh. So look at those clouds. It uh, looks like lava. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mark Gray sent this in and uh, it was taken just after, after some showers. So the uh -huh. sun started bursting through the, the clouds after the showers. And that was his view while he was having a workout. So not a bad view <laughs> at all. So if you have a photo to send in, please uh, email it to us at uh, nlphotos at cbc.ca. We love to get them and we love to share them. <laughs> That's our program for this Friday for this week. Have a great weekend, everyone. Good night.